Okay, so now we got a 2-2 series as Kawhi and PG continue to go nuclear as uh, Finney Smith and Kleba cannot guard them one-on-one. And on the other end, we have Dallas finally looking human, very human, as in like me, uh, from three-point land. And there's other things, of course, but those are the main two things, right? And as I said with the last game, I think when the Clippers have no center, it just opens up the floor so much and it makes it really difficult for Dallas to bring extra defenders on the guys driving. Uh, To speak on those drives, uh, Finney Smith and Kleba and whoever else it might be, they're just not containing Kawhi or PG at all. Uh, There was also a couple plays where like Rondo or Reggie Jackson would get in there and then they would kick it out and then the swing... Uh, passes from the Clippers were really good. That's how PG got 1-3 in the corner. There was also another one where I think it was like from Batum to Morris after a kick out, something like that. I don't remember exactly. But, uh, you know, they're making the extra pass, and then again, Dallas just can't do anything with the initial stuff. And, I mean, in terms of defenders, the only other guy they've got is uh, Richardson. You could try him with Kleba and Finney Smith. I don't think there's a lot of other options besides double teaming, which we saw in uh, game one on Kawhi. Now the fear there is, well, if the Clippers have no no center, everybody can shoot. So you're going to have to be really good on the rotations and the closeouts and all that, but it could be their only option. But if the Clippers are ready for that, then they can relocate guys off the ball and you can have success there. So it's not easy. I guess they could also try a zone defense without double teaming. I don't know, man. I mean, the best bet really might just be back up on them just enough to where they don't beat you to the drive and just hope that they're going to miss some jump shots. Now, I think the counter to that, if it would be effective, would be for the Clippers to bring Rondo in there because, as I keep saying, when Rondo's in there, Kawhi and PG have a little bit more movement off the ball where they might be setting screens or they get into the post rather than dribbling into the post, and that could freak out Dallas's defense if they're able to slow down the Clippers uh, before Rondo has to be out there or whatever. Even so, I think their help off of those drives was really bad in parts of this game. I mean, eventually they kind of got it together a little bit more in the third quarter, but there were stretches, especially in the second quarter, it was just like... If Kawhi beats Kleba or if PG beats Finney Smith or whoever might be on them, the rotations were just not there or they were there way too late. So, you know, defensive fundamentals, all that stuff, but sometimes that's what matters. Anyway, the other thing with the Mavs was, of course, uh, their offense went super cold and some of it was just they missed a lot of open shots. I mean, they shot insanely well from three in the first few games, and in this game, I felt like most of the threes that they attempted were threes that they've been making this whole series, and they just didn't go in, and you will expect that they will bounce back. Now, of course, the Clippers had something to do with that. I don't want to act like it was just the Mavs missing and nothing else. I mean, they're probably not going to shoot, what was that one game, like 18 for 35 or something insane? Maybe they don't shoot that well again, but they're going to shoot better than they did in this game. And Luka also missed a couple of jumpers over Zubats that he's been making in this series. So I still am not super freaked out about Dallas's offense. I think they just had one really bad shooting game combined with Luka and the free throws, which continue to just be like, what the hell? I mean, his form is not bad on free throws, right? I mean, yeah, sure, his arm, like, rotates a little bit on the way up, and I don't know if that's something, but this is just something else. Maybe he just shoots it too hard or shoots it not hard enough. I don't I don't get it. He's a 74% career free throw shooter, so I don't know. Uh, if I didn't talk about the Luka pick and rolls, I think, similar to Dallas's offense as a whole, I feel like they pretty much got the shots they wanted. It's just didn't go in, you know. I mean, the guy went to... I remember he had like an ISO step back on Kawhi. He had one on Batum, and they just they just didn't drop, and they've been dropping for the series. So I don't know. Uh, to think about Przingis and just where he's at with the whole Clippers playing small thing. I mean, Dallas did go to him sub, and he was really aggressive in the first uh, quarter. 
I think he had like two or three straight makes. He had the first bucket of the game, which was that shot over, I want to say it was Batum from about 15 feet out. I mean, it's cool, but I just don't know if it's really going to be enough to make the Clippers pay for not having a center out there sometimes. If he was more physical and was grabbing offensive rebounds and getting a lot of trips to the line off of it, then I I would be a little more intrigued. But he's just going to have to keep on making shots. And I mean, Perzingis has not proven to be good enough from mid-range and all that. Like, I know he looks like an amazing shooter sometimes, but like he's never been as close to Dirk or Chris Paul or Kevin Durant or Kawhi from mid-range as he's really needed to be. Now that said, maybe you just go nuts for a few games. We'll, we'll see. Anyway, to think about the uh, the Boban minutes, which was Carlisle's first real thing to try to counter the size. I don't know. The, the thing with Boban is like he comes in the game and the Mavericks' entire offense changes. And suddenly it's like, get this guy the ball in the post and stuff. And I just think it's too away from what they want to do. Like, I don't want Boban posting up all day if I can have Luka doing everything he's doing. So if they can try to coexist with Boban on the court, maybe. Of course, the Clippers are going to go at him every single possession when he's out there, and we'd have to see if he could hold up defensively. But, I mean, maybe. Maybe Boban could be the answer. It's just just transforms Dallas into a whole different team on offense, and I don't think that's good for them outside of a few minutes here and there. I mean, there were possessions where Luka had to chuck up like a 12-footer, and he still managed to make a few of them because he's great, but he had to because Boban was just killing all the spacing inside. Whereas if it's Perzingis and Kleba, then it's more opened up. I think some other ideas for Dallas's offense could be getting uh, some more off-ball stuff. They ran some off-ball action for Luka. I think there was one in particular that came after he missed a couple of shots just off of, you know, creating his own thing. Not that I remember what the specific play was. I think it was like a handoff or something. Kind of reminiscent of the Devin Booker stuff from Game 1 in that series. So maybe. I think Hardaway could benefit from that type of thing as well. But again, I'm not too concerned with Dallas's offense. I just think this was a really bad night. And... More so, the question is, do they have anything to slow down Kawhi and PG? And uh, based on how it's gone so far, the answer would be no. So it, it might just have to be outscoring them, and I think Dallas can do that. So we'll see. I mean, the Clippers, they clearly changed the series when they just decided we're going to favor our wing players over our centers, and Dallas has really not figured it out. And then, again, they got a really bad shooting night to uh, go along with that. 